cup of coffee, then I'll... Welcome back to Coffee Time. i got a little story to tell you. <clears throat> Instead of a series of different things, I'm, because it's going to be a little lengthy, I'm going to just tell you the one story about my week having to go to the border. A little bit about the Venezuelans, a little bit about an adventure that happened to me. Adventure is using a nice word. And getting back here uh, to my house in Cuenca. First I'm going to show you some clips along the way. Some I narrated, some I didn't. Um, there's maybe six minutes of those. And then I'm going to get back to you and tell you the story. So let's take a look. Well, I'll tell you, sometimes it's just bullshit. I've been here for over half an hour trying to catch a taxi and people walk right out and grab it and uh, they just keep ignoring me doesn't matter where i stand uh, one guy actually stopped i told him where i was going to go and he tried to tell me it was going to be five dollars <laughs> and then he drove off i don't know what the hell <laughs> Si yo me vine para acá, fue a empezar de cero, a dejar todo un pasado atrás. Pero la realidad es que no tengo familia, no conozco a nadie y no cuento con ningún otro apoyo más que con el de ustedes. So, on some advice, I came down here to get my hair cut. And look what I found. Oh, isn't that cute a little pinguino truck? That's not really a truck. And a closer look at the little park. See the IESS building in the background there. And this town, I can safely say, is overrun with Venezuelans coming across the border. A lot of them just can't go any farther. It's from the balcony of the hotel here in Tulcan. I've never come down here to the center before because I'm always just rushing through. That truck pulled in front of this bus and broke its mirror and then ran. And this truck, or this bus, did a low speed chase way off of the route to get ahead of that guy and pull him over. In the meantime, he was on the phone calling the police who met here. It's going to be a slight delay.
saw some interesting clips, right? So what happened was I got a call from a couple friends who wanted some help being the first time of crossing the border and knowing that there'd be some difficulties there. Uh, plus, I've got a few shortcuts. So I said, okay, sure. So I hop the bus and I go up. The first thing you could see in those clips when I had to bleep out my, my word, I was a little frustrated. It was maybe 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. If you're going to get the ticket to the Tolcom border on the Flota Imbabura sleeper bus, there's only one bus. And so you really want to, uh, per day, so you really want to get that ticket ahead of time. So I went the day before to buy the ticket. That's why I was at the bus terminal. And it was frustrating because it was one of those cases that you run into once in a while. We're just not going to bother with the gringos. And that $5 that he wanted to charge me, that was actually a $2, $2.25 fare where I was going. I wasn't returning back home. <clears throat> going back home, it's $3. It was $2.25. I was just pretty annoyed that, you know, he blatantly wanted to fleece me, not use the meter. And uh, I'm not a big fan of crooks. So I just quit trying to get a taxi there at the bus station. I walked out to the main road, flag going down, everything was fine. But um, I ended up standing there for about 45 minutes, which is sad because there was a constant flow of taxis. It's not like I had to sit there and wait for a taxi to show up. There was lines of taxis. So... Enough about that. Now, in the clip with the lady on the bus who was basically almost crying and telling her story about how she didn't have a family and she was all alone, and it's kind of heart wrenching. I, I'm a, I'm a sucker for some of those. Now, you do get a little hardened and a little immune to some of them that come on that. You know, it's really kind of a stretch. It's contrived. Bottom line is, you never really know. But, um, I don't know, the plea in her voice. And she was trying to sell candies. I didn't want any candies, so I just gave her something. But um, you're going to run into this uh, fairly often. You know, I suggest you try not to be hardened to it and try to give people the benefit of the doubt. On the other hand, you do have to be careful because you really, unless you're rich, you can't afford to be giving out money all day long every day. And you can run into that. So I got to Tulcon and I was waiting for a message saying, hey, we're here at the border, you know, come on down. And uh, knowing how these things can be a few hours, I just figured I'd just get a few things done. And I desperately needed a haircut so I asked for directions I was told where this place was and sure enough apparently it was my barbershop apparently it was my hair salon barbershop because I've got my name on the door so I went in and waited got a haircut it was you know it's a haircut it's not terrible my <clears throat> But they were very nice, they were pleasant. The haircut there was $3, I believe. And then from the haircut, I walked out, I looked around the, that's really the Central Park area, kind of looked around there, saw what was going on, uh, went back up to the hotel room, you know, as you could see, took a little video, kind of just checking out the town. My opinion of the town, I don't really want to get negative. I would just say you really only want to go there if you have to go there, if you're headed to the border or coming back from the border. So I get the message. I get the call. Come on down. So I get down there. And I'm sorry I didn't take more clips. You're just constantly jostled. And the clips that I got, it looked like there weren't any people around or that many people. It's because it was really the only place I could pull my cell phone out where it wasn't going to get knocked out of my hands and walked on. Uh, it, was, it was in the area on the Colombian side as you're uh, entering or leaving the bridge. 
and um, I just I just took some quick views. What you didn't see in those, and now I'm kicking myself for just not taking the time, uh, was the huge amount of people, the squatters areas, the people, 10, 12, 15 people huddled in a big circle because none of them have warm clothes. And it was cold and it was rainy and these people are just physically shaking, some of them violently. And um, I have to confess, I felt it was so bad that I really felt kind of awkward filming them. I, I guess I'm not a professional that can do that without feeling. I felt almost like they were on display, like monkeys in a zoo or something. And here comes the, I don't know, it just, it just felt funny. Uh, but I can tell you that by far, as you know, I've been going to this border for the last couple years and reporting on the, the constant increase of Venezuelans coming through and how the border crossing used to take under an hour and then it went to two or three hours, then it went to four or five hours, and now we're talking days. We're talking days. Um, what you have to do is track down one of these guys that you will find, they're very covert. I learned this uh, three or four crossings ago. And you slip them a $20 bill and he'll take you to the front of the line. And uh, they have a little network going on with the guards at the front of the line, the police, they're in on it. And so if they bring you up, then you can go right on into the building. Right or wrong, that's how I do it. As far as Venezuelans, it's, it's getting tougher and tougher um, to see, to hear the stories. Uh, every time I go to the border, I make a point to talk to some people. And no, my Spanish isn't fluent. I can understand for the most part, but a lot of Venezuelans speak a little bit of English. And between the two, I find people, I just walk up, and I ask a question about what their story is, somebody in that group has a little bit of English and between the two of us, we can work out, you know, what's going on. And the stories I hear are heartbreaking, they're fascinating. They're all essentially the same story, no matter where they come from. And I'll tell you, the, the thing that gets me kind of riled up about this whole Venezuelan thing. Having been involved in this now for a couple years and here in Cuenca helping people, you know, to get acclimated as, as you're aware if you've been watching these and talk, having these stories, talk to people on the border. Uh, and then you go on Facebook and you see these jokers that want to make it political. And they get all political about defending socialism and how it's the imperialist USA that caused all of this and blah, 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 blah. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. It has nothing to do with reality. It has nothing to do with the stories that I get from people that are there, people in the know. I talked to one guy whose job was at the refinery. He was an older guy. And he was one of the people that was thrown out after they did a strike and he was thrown out. So Chavez, this was back when Chavez was in power, could put all his cronies. He put the military in charge. He put political allies in these jobs and all the engineers and expertise were fired, which is why everything fall, fell apart as far as the oil refineries and the extraction process, all of that just fell apart. If I were hearing differing stories from people from all over the country of Venezuela, then I might buy into some of that stuff. But I hear the same story. It's all the same. So um, before you get on your high horse and go defending socialism and get all political and philosophical, I suggest you get up there on the border and you start talking to these people. I'll tell you right now, you're going to feel like an ass. These people are trying to survive. Their country is all but lost. 
Many of them have family members that have died from starvation, from lack of medicine, from gang crime. And I have been able to confirm, actually through a journalist, but I, I got the story originally some uh, from one of my Venezuelan friends here in Cuenca, who was at my house talking to her mother while I was there, and I couldn't believe my ears hearing part of this conversation about eating people, and I thought I misunderstood. It's growing. There is, and it's certainly not rampant. I don't want to give the wrong impression, but it's happening. There's cannibalism going on in Venezuela. And after I heard about that, I actually threw it on Facebook. Anybody hear about this? It seems pretty bizarre. On the other hand, I was privy to this conversation. It wasn't staged. It was, it was a mother in terror, so glad her daughter got out. And, um, and so I got, you know, I got all the, you know, the Yankee imperialists created this and they're creating stories and all this, you know, the crap that you get on Facebook. But I was contacted by a journalist who goes in about once a month for a number of days up to a week and gets out. Somehow he's from, well, he's actually he's French. And so he gets in, he gets out, and he said the story is true. He says, you're not going to see it on the news. I mean, a lot of things about Venezuela are covered up. As a matter of fact, I did a couple videos more direct about Venezuela, and they were instantly demonetized by YouTube because this is a taboo subject. It's tough to get information out. It's tough to get accurate information. And he told me that he's, he's been to some of the towns where this has occurred. And he, what he told me, what the history of it, was it began with in prisons. There's people in prison, and of course they're going to be the last on the food chain, apparently. And, um, and most of those prisons, they, they busted out and nobody cares. And, but while they were in prison, in order to eat, they would prey on the weaker. Now, as disgusting and as outlandish and bizarre as that might sound, it's also logical. I mean, if the guards don't have anything to eat, do you really think they're going to give it to the prisoners? So, there's a lot of horrific things occurring. So, again, I would just plea. You can have your political opinions. It doesn't help. And in fact, from the people that are coming from there, it's all pretty insulting. I mean, it's almost like blaming them. And yeah, they did their vote, but when they realized they voted the other way, they get put in prison, they get shot, their vote doesn't count anyway. So, it's a horrendous situation. It was, uh, it was a tough week, so I come back, I get on a bus to run to do something, and a truck pulls out and hits this bus. Breaks, hits the front of the bus, pulls right out in front of him, hits it. The bus driver, he's like blowing his horn. The truck isn't pulling over. The truck speeds up. So I, I mentioned is a low speed chase. I don't know what else you call it. This big truck and this bus lumbering down the highway. He's blowing his horn. He's on his cell phone. He's he's talking to the police, telling them where you know where he is and what happened. And the truck decides, he pulls off on another road, and then he pulls off on another road. Bus didn't give up. Damned with the route. And he just kept going. And it got to a point where it was two lane, and he was able to eke his way ahead. It was kind of comical, because they're both slow. But he's, you know, and going through the gears, and, and he just gets in front. And he pulls in front of him like this. And so the, the truck has to stop. And the bus gets right up and just stops crossroad. And eventually the police showed up and he moved the bus over to the curb. And so he gets out and about 10 or 15 guys on the bus get out with him to go over. Apparently if he gives them any crap, they're all going to beat him up or something. I don't know. So I'm just sitting on the bus. It's like... 
I've had enough already, you know. So, but then I decide, well, let me let me take a video clip. I have almost no clips on this little expedition, so let me get one about the bus accident. Because curiously, you don't really see that many accidents as bad as people drive. So, so I say I'll get a clip, and you saw me um, showing on the bus, and then outside. Well, those people that were on the bus, after I did that bus in the clip, they actually left the bus. So I get off the bus thinking I'm the last person. So I do the clip that you see. And then I go back on. And there's nobody else on the bus. But I see my backpack is in a different place and it's partly open. I never carry my passport in my backpack. But I had just done something with it. I slipped it into the pocket because I was going to be heading back to the hotel. Well, it doesn't matter why, but I did. It was gone. My passport's gone. I'm the last person off the bus. What the heck? So the police are there. I let them know. Well, they took that very seriously. And they were very good to me. They didn't want me to leave town, at least not right away. They wanted to get this passport back. And so they're on the radio, on their cell phones, they're, you know, letting everybody know. And uh, I ended up staying a couple days. But I will tell you that the end result of it was it was a Venezuelan in desperate situation trying to survive. He grabbed that passport. He ended up trying to sell it to this guy who was a brother to one of the cops. Well, needless to say, once that happened, you know, they caught the guy, they got the passport. I'm so happy I got my passport back. And they, they kind of asked me my opinion, and I, I don't care, I got my passport, I am happy. And they let the guy go. And I, I asked if that's regular, and I didn't get an answer to that. But basically, um, they're seeing all this go on too, and he said something along the lines of he's had enough of his own problems. But I do believe, if I understood everything correctly, was he was warned and told, do not step foot back into the town. Um, so I got my passport back. And at the end of the week, I could go home. Well, I got to wait one more day for my bus. So uh, one more day in a hotel. And then I come on back. The one bus a day that goes from Tulcan direct to Cuenca through Quito was full. So I had to wait till the next day. Or... I could take another bus to Quito and in Quito catch a bus to Cuenca. And because there were so many hours, like 28 hours or something, uh, between those two times, I decided that that's what I'll do. So I get on a bus to Quito, horrific bus. You know, these, these smaller buses, oh my God, it was just, it was horrific. It vibrated so bad friend of mine asked me, where are you now? And I took a picture of the bus and it was so blurry. I went ahead and sent it because, you know, you just, I couldn't get a clear photo inside the bus. So I sent him the picture. Ha, ha, ha. So I get to Quito and now I want to find the, uh, the Flota Imbabura bus to Cuenca. And from there, there's a whole bunch of them. Like every half hour to an hour, there's a bus. So I get there, full, 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 full. The next five buses are full. The sixth bus had one seat left. Number 40, all the way in the back by the toilet. <laughs> but it turns out some good news starts happening here. It was a new bus. It was a great bus. And the benefit of all these crowding on the buses 
every single person on that bus was going to Cuenca. I mean, that never happens. But every person was going to Cuenca. Therefore, no stops. What is typically considered fast at a, about a nine hour trip was just under seven and a half hours. I mean, that's like, wow. On top of that, it's a really comfortable bus. It had, it looked like being inside an airplane cabin and it had all the little TVs, leather seats, went way back, had lake supports, really, really comfortable. I actually fell asleep for probably five and a half hours, which again, something that just never happens. But on the other hand, I was pretty worn out at that point. Uh, not so much that I was doing things, but you know, it was a little stressful. So, uh, because you know I'm trying to move and I got a lot of things to do and I'm losing all this time. You know, so it's just a lot of things that's, ah! But I got home at six o'clock in the morning, got in the shower, laid down, didn't get up till about almost one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, here we are. Now, the last clips is while I'm in the terminal in Quito. Keep in mind, you didn't know this, that day happened to be Ecuador's Independence Day. And so these dancers came in, where there's just throngs of Venezuelans. These dancers came in and just put on a show after a show after a show. They must have been exhausted because they were dancing on and off for a couple hours. And the uh, last thing I'll mention on a clip is, you know, it said no buses today. There was kiosk after kiosk after kiosk. I, only, I took a video of two. I could have taken dozens where the buses were just full. Just full. Something that it never happens. You had thousands of people in this terminal. Of course, right? So, that's my story of this past week. What adventure did you have? Uh, Take a write down in the comments. Tell me what your week was made up of. And uh, I'll see you in the next video.